What we're talking about is correlation versus causation. Because yes, there is a correlation between weight and certain conditions, but everybody can be impacted and affected by those conditions. That's why weight is not the cause of them, weight is correlated with them. Hello YouTube and welcome to the Body Honesty Project. My name is Lydia and today we will be discussing correlation and causality. Now, I did a video like this, I think last spring or last summer, but I wanted to revisit the topic because in light of the new data from the Ozempic studies, I really think I have a much stronger case. Now, my background is computer science and mathematics, so I love to play with numbers and see what sort of sense I can make of them. This will not be a scientific proof, but I think that the evidence from the Ozempic studies really shows that obesity is a cause of disease and not simply a correlation. So why don't we watch this next clip then come back and discuss. That's why weight is not the cause of them. Weight is correlated with them. These TikToks infuriate me. I just know that there is a stronger relationship between weight and disease than these people will ever say. I just need the numbers to back it up. The data from the Ozempic studies sure highlighted the benefits of weight loss with respect to disease. Maybe there's something I can use in there. When they compared Ozempic to Trulicity, Trulicity dropped A1C by an average of 1.3 points compared to an average of 1.6 points with Ozempic. In another study, people using Bidurion got an average A1C reduction of 0.9 points, while those taking Ozempic got a 1.5% point drop. And when they compared it to Victoza, Ozempic reduced A1C by an average of 1.7 points compared to 1 point in Victoza. There's even a clinical trial that compared Ozempic to Lantus, the most commonly used long-acting basal insulin. Insulin is considered the most powerful weapon that we have to lower blood glucose. And in that study, people using Ozempic saw an average A1C drop of 1.5 points compared to 0.9 points in people given Lantus. I'll be honest, that surprised me. As far as weight loss, people using Trulicity lost an average of about 6 pounds compared to almost 13 pounds of weight loss with Ozempic. When they compared it to Bidurion, people taking Bidurion lost an average of about 4 pounds compared to over 12 pounds with Ozempic. And when they compared it to Victoza, people taking Victoza lost just over 4 pounds compared to 13 pounds almost with Ozempic. So wait, all GLP-1 diabetes medications lower A1C and produce weight loss. But Ozempic lowers A1C the most and drops weight the most. If Lantus, the drug that is best at improving insulin secretion, didn't lower A1C the most, wouldn't that mean that weight loss is not only a factor, but a crucial factor for lowering A1C? Previous studies have shown that weight loss on its own also lowers A1C. So isn't it a fair assumption to make that the reason why Ozempic lowers A1C the most is because it also lowers weight the most? And if correlation is two things happening at the same time, is it still correlation if the change in one directly results in the change of the other? If obesity and high A1C levels are occurring concurrently and a drop in obesity produces a drop in A1C, wouldn't you say that that's causal, not correlated? Because if it wasn't, what was the cause? And if we get into the causes of obesity, remember this. Some of the contributors to obesity include disordered eating, age-related changes, genetic and epigenetic factors, smoking cessation, sleep deficits, the gut microbiota, physical disabilities, maternal and paternal obesity, increased sedentary time. Well, of all those causes, Ozempic only addresses appetite. The drug doesn't make people exercise. It doesn't change weight status of your parents. It doesn't change your genetics, and it doesn't stop you from aging. It only controls your appetite. So if most people that take Ozempic lose weight, and the only thing that changed was their appetite, wouldn't you say that food intake is causal to obesity? And based on the Ozempic data, can we not also say that obesity causes high A1C levels and type 2 diabetes? But wait, there's more. 
Another really nice benefit that Ozempic has over other certain types of diabetes medications, including some in the same class, is that it's been shown to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. Like all new type 2 diabetes medications, Ozempic was required to be tested in a dedicated clinical trial to prove that it doesn't raise the risk of heart disease. And in that study, they actually found that it reduced the risk by 26%. And this is important because the risk of things like cardiovascular death, heart attacks, and strokes are so much higher in people with type 2 diabetes that we need to do everything we can to try to reduce the risk of people experiencing one of those events. So wait, this drug that was never meant to treat heart disease not only is safe, but actually reduces risk. And look, it's now been approved to treat heart disease patients too. But why? What does this drug do? Well, normal heart medications thin blood, open arteries, and increase circulation. This drug does none of that. It addresses only insulin resistance and weight gain. So if the only beneficial thing this drug does for patients with heart disease is lower their weight, and they also experience a 26% decreased risk of heart disease, don't you think that weight is more than just a correlation? The drug affects your appetite which is the cause of weight gain. Then it decreases your weight, which also lowers your risk of heart disease. If weight was only correlated to heart disease, a drop in weight wouldn't result in such a substantial decrease in risk. So let's summarize that information. Ozempic is the leading diabetes medication available now because it lowers A1C the most. It also lowers your weight the most, and weight loss has been shown to lower A1C levels on its own. So doesn't that mean that lowering your weight is causal to lowering your A1C? Therefore, increasing your weight would also be causal to increasing your A1C? And then when we look at the heart medications, we see that Ozempic is now used to treat patients that have heart disease. But it doesn't thin blood or open arteries or improve circulation. It only helps you lose weight. And the weight loss on its own makes a 26% decrease risk in developing heart disease. So why is it that it's just a correlation when the only thing that we're manipulating here is weight? I think there's far too much evidence here to simply call it a correlation. So with all of that information in mind, Let's now revisit the TikTok from Hannah about correlation and causality. One of the most common questions I get is how can you say there's no relationship between weight and health? And first of all, virtually nobody is saying that. What I and many other fat activists are saying, and in fact, we're begging people to understand this, is that as it stands in the current research, the relationship between weight and health is correlational, not causal. So some research methods 101. When two things are correlated, it means that they're happening at the same time. It does not mean that one thing is causing the other thing. For example, there is a very strong correlation between male pattern baldness and heart attacks, which is true. Now, based on that information, should we ascertain that baldness causes heart attacks? Should we try to get bald men to grow hair in an effort to reduce their likelihood of having a heart attack and then blame them when they can't do it? No, because what's actually happening is that a third factor seems to be at play, which contributes to both baldness and heart attacks. What I'm suggesting is that we look much more closely at the third factors at play when it comes to weight and health. For example, fat people frequently have our blood pressure taken with blood pressure cuffs that are too small. The problem with that is that when you use a cuff that's too small, it will always result in a false high reading. And this happens all the time. So these are the kinds of things I think about when someone says that fat people have higher rates of hypertension. I think, of course we do. We are constantly getting false high readings. And more broadly, there are a number of very influential third factors that contribute to the overall trend of health problems for fat people, such as weight stigma, also known as the stress of discrimination, something that fat people experience a lot. Another is weight cycling. Virtually all fat people have tried to lose weight at some point in our lives, but pursuing weight loss is a virtual guarantee that someone will experience weight cycling, which is extremely hard on the body. And finally, we have inaccessible, inequitable, and biased healthcare. Fat people experience all of these things, and all of them contribute to illness. But despite all of these third factors discrimination, stress, weight cycling, limited healthcare, biased healthcare, incompetent healthcare, and a lack of proper medical equipment 
The cultural conversation around weight and health refuses to evolve. People, especially thin people, tend to be very committed to upholding fat phobia. People are just more comfortable believing that fat people do bad things and that leads to bad health and thin people do good things and that leads to good health, despite the fact that we know that's very misleading, very stigmatizing and often untrue. Turns out the pushback that I get on this topic, it's not really about health. It was fat phobia all along, guys. So Hannah's definition of correlation was two things happening at the same time. Now, there's a very, very popular example of correlation, which is ice cream sales versus outdoor swimming pool deaths, because they correlate. But the reason why they correlate is because there is the third factor of weather, because warm weather increases ice cream sales, as well as increases the number of people that go swimming in outdoor pools, thus increases outdoor swimming pool deaths. But this correlation can be broken with an external factor. What if all the dairy farmers went on strike and there was no ice cream? Well, the warm weather would still drive people to go swimming. And what if some of the pools had to close because of construction? Well, the warm weather would still drive people to buy ice cream, but not as many people would go swimming and then not as many people would die. The same cannot be true with obesity and disease. Because if obesity and diabetes are occurring at the same time, and the afflicted person undergoes some sort of external stress or trauma that causes them to lose weight, their A1C is also gonna drop. The external event was not related to the disease, but the drop in weight will cause a drop in A1C, which is why I say it's causal and not correlated. And for Hannah's hair loss example with the correlation between obesity, hair loss, and heart disease, she is right. There is a third factor. But the third factor is obesity because obesity increases your risk of heart disease as well as hair loss. That's because decreased circulation accelerates the hair loss process. So yes, Hannah, there is a third factor. You just have them out of order. Now, I'd also like to go back to the jock scientist's point that everybody can be impacted and affected by those conditions. That's why weight is not the cause of them. Weight is correlated with them. And I question that logic, because why can we not have multiple causes? Why must we only have one cause? Because we can accomplish things in multiple ways. There isn't always one cause. If I were to play a lot of extreme sports, there would be an increased risk that I would break a limb. But I don't have to play extreme sports to break a limb. I could break my leg jumping out of a plane, or I could break my leg getting run over by a bus. I don't have to do that action in order to break my leg. The cause could be the impact of hitting the ground, or the cause could be the pressure of the bus running over my leg. Both are valid causes. So just because thin people can also get diabetes and heart disease does not mean that obesity does not pose additional risk. A thin person could get a heart attack due to low hemoglobin versus a fat person getting a heart attack due to a clogged artery. They are both valid causes. They're just different and they both have the same end result, meaning your heart stops beating. And I also want to point out that thin people can also have heart attacks due to the same consequences that are afflicting obese people. A person can look thin on the outside and have a lot of fat on the inside. And guess what? The same prescription applies to them too. Their doctors too will tell them the importance of good nutrition and moving their body, even though they are already thin. And I don't understand why we can't call this a cause. This is a blocked artery. What is it blocked by? Fat. The fat is impeding the blood from flowing to the heart. If we can reduce the fat, the blood will flow. Why can this not be a cause? Do all obese people get this affliction? No. But is your risk higher if you are obese? Yes. So can we not deduce that obesity increases your risk of developing arterial plaque, which will cause a heart attack? 
At the end of Hannah's video, she brought up a whole lot of things about fat phobia and stigma with fat patients in the medical industry. And I actually agree with a lot of the things that she said. I do think that changes need to be made, but not in the direction that Hannah was going. I do believe that we should be more compassionate when we're caring for all patients. And I also think that we do need to put more emphasis on mental health. When someone has an illness, their prescription should include psychological and emotional support and help. I don't think it's effective to shame people into losing weight, but I also don't think that it's effective or helpful to tell people that they're fine as is and to not lose weight. We need to do a better effort at providing the tools and support that people need in order to do weight loss in an effective way to be successful. Two weeks ago, I showed a video where Dr. Stanford was saying to treat obesity like a disease. Now, in my opinion, and I'm not a doctor, this is my personal opinion, I think we should take it one step farther and treat it like an addiction. And I am someone who has been through recovery. I did a non 12 step program and it helped me so much. It gets to the core of your cognitive distortions. It helps you see the truth and make plans in order to get better. And the type of people that were in my recovery group were recovering from addictions of all sorts. It wasn't just drugs and alcohol, it's drugs, alcohol, sex, gambling, social media, food, Everyone was all together and we were all dealing with our problems in a way that made us more accountable and responsible and empowered. I'm also a big believer in therapy. My therapist helped me uncover my childhood traumas and really start to heal. All of this is necessary when you are embarking on major lifestyle changes. And I think that we should put emotional and psychological support at the forefront when we're treating patients support that's needed to help them do the right things, not support that tells them you're fine as is. Because being nice to people's feelings while shielding them from the truth isn't very kind or honest. And on this channel, we're all about being honest. So until next time, stay body positive, but also body honest.